This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. The church has been blinded. Christianity has been blinded to this too long. This awesome truth. What could be more important than knowing who your God is? Paul knew who his God was. Philippians 4, 19, but my God. Who was Paul's God? He had somebody in mind. But my God. You know who your God is. I know I'm talking to the choir here tonight, and I know you all know. But there's a big old world out there that does not know. But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Paul did not say my God is Christ Jesus. He said my God is going to do this by Christ Jesus. And then verse 20 gives more understanding because he says now unto God and our Father. So he tells us who he's thinking about. But unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank God for His Son who has awesome glory. His glory is so bright that it's going to destroy the Antichrist when He comes. Jesus. But His is a given glory. As has already been said here tonight, it's a given glory. God the Father's glory is self-consistent. Nobody gave God his glory. His glory is an eternal glory. So give glory to God for the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him. Everybody say worship Him who made the heaven and earth and the sea and the fountain of water. Right? Who is that? It's God. That's our God. Let's just go back here for a second. That, that question arose the other night. I know you all agree with me on this because the Bible is just full of it. In Isaiah, well, let's go to uh, 4310. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I love it. Verse 12. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Right? Right? Okay, and then let's go on to uh, 44, verse 8. I know y'all probably know these by heart. But, verse 8 of 40, chapter 44, last half. You are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. God said, I don't know another God beside me. I'm the only one in the God family. Right? That's right. Our precious Lord Jesus, a man, not a body full of God, a man full of God. But being full of God does not make you God. Verse 24 of 44. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things. That stretcheth forth the heavens alone. That spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. What is it about by myself that we don't understand? Right? Right? I mean, we say, what, what part of no don't you understand? What part of by myself do we not understand? Okay, 45, verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. 
Isn't that wonderful? Verse 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. I'm glad I know him personally. Verse 18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, for he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Verse 21, who hath told it from that time, have not I the Lord, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. 46 and 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. And I am God, and there is none like me. That's what I was writing when I thought I was writing a gospel track. Because I was looking for God. And when I found God, then I began, began to understand. There is one eternal most high God. And he has a supernaturally conceived virgin born son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who is second in command to God the Father. Amen. Paul said God 513 times in his writing. Not one time was he referring to the Lord Jesus Christ that you can prove. So if I find another verse over here that seems to make Jesus supreme God, I'm just not understanding that verse because I've got 513 witnesses that it's this way. Understand? All right? Peter said God 46 times in his two epistles and not one time. You can check this any day at your house. Real easy. It just takes a little while to read First and Second Peter. And he says, God, 46 times, take your highlight pen and highlight every, the word God in those two epistles, and there's 46 of them, and it's not even a question who he's talking about. He starts off, 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about God the Father. And everyone there in that to those two epistles, has to agree with that. Right? So if you read 40 times, and there's more than 40 times that God said, I did it, and then you find a, a us over here, there has to be an answer. So let's let God tell us who was there. There's not one verse in the Bible that said that Jesus was there. You might try to infer it, but there's not one verse that clearly says Jesus was there. There were some sons of God there, and God said in Job, Job, while I created, the sons of God shouted for joy. It all gets back to John chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. The King James Bible translators, I respect them. We're blessed every day by the work they did, but they were Trinitarians, and they made a few mistakes. Now, I'm sorry to tell you that. I wish I didn't have to say that, but it is a fact. In 1 John 3.16, it says God laid down his life for us. I brought this out the other night. The word God is in italics. 
John wrote John 3.16. What does it say? God so loved the world that he gave his son to die for us. His son died. John is not going to turn around in 1 John 3.16 and contradict what he said in John 3.16, right? That God died for us. So the word God is in italics, and they signal to us in that manner that that is a word they supply. Can you put up 1 John 2.23? Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. The last half of that verse is in italics. John didn't write that. It's just look in the front of your King James Bible and it'll say that anything that's in italics was not in the original. How many know that? Okay. Uh, you know, we, the truth makes you free. Truth frees up your mind. The truth makes you stronger with your witness when you go out of here. You don't have to be ambiguous about it because the Bible is not ambiguous about it. Okay, this truth. But anyway, the last half of that verse is in italics. 1 John 5 and 7, would you put that up, please? And I am not here to put any doubt on this Bible. But you and I are grown, and we're old enough to know that the enemy, God is custodian of this word. And we have everything we need for life and ministry. Right here. God's custodian of it. So I, I, you know, man has got in to try to affect the truth. So 1 John 5, 7 is an example. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. About the only Bibles you will find that in is the King James or the New King James. It is not in the NIV. It is not in the NASB. It is not in the Holman CSB. You know why it's not in the NIV? They tell you at the bottom of the page in their notes, this verse cannot be found in any manuscript older than the 1500s. There are 5,000 ancient Greek manuscripts going back to early times, and that verse is not in one of them. And so I know these guys have been criticized that do the modern translations for leaving that out, but even Trinitarian scholars admit that John did not write what we call John, 1 John 5, 7. Now you can study that however you want to, but we, we're mostly grown here tonight and we're old enough to know the truth. Okay, in the other Bible it just says, it leaves that verse out and then the verse that's, uh, verse 8, can you put up verse 8? It says, there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. And it's pretty likely that John did write that. That's in the older manuscripts. But the verse before about the three, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, that's a good Trinitarian-looking verse that Trinitarian scholars say is not in the original. I can show you over and over and over, Ryrie, Erickson, Richardson, the Trinitarian scholars had to acknowledge that that is not something that John wrote, that it was added later. They lost one of their strongest, what they considered Trinitarian scriptures. Okay. So I just want you to be discerning and, and know that we have everything in this Bible we need. Right? 
And it's not to say that we're going to prove this by saying something's not wrong with this Bible. And here's why I'm saying again that if the Bible says it 40 times one way, take it. Right? And if it says it five, see the New Testament says God over 1,300 times when it is clearly not talking about the Lord Jesus. How many witnesses do you need? There's 1,300 right there. And then over the, in the Bible, there are 10,000, over 10,000. Still with me? There are over 10,000 singular pronouns and verbs referring to God. He, him, me, I, never they, we, them, not a one. So if 10,000 singular nouns and verbs won't prove to somebody or anybody that God is one, then God will have to deal with them. I've done about all I can do. Right? Okay, let me, let me show you something that is in line with this that you may not know. There were eight top translations of the Bible. I'm going to comfort you here just a little. There were eight top translations of the Bible done in the 1500s. It was first thought, now I didn't know this about the English language, but it was such a developing language back in the Dark Ages that it was commonly thought that the English language was not strong enough to support a Bible translation. But men began to take courage and say, we can translate this Greek into English. It will support a Bible translation. And so one of the first fellows to do it was a precious man by the name of Brother Tyndale. And he translated his Bible. I have it right here. William Tyndale in 1526. He was burned at the stake for doing this. But he wanted English speaking people to have a Bible they could read. And so he translated it from Greek to English. He said the English language will support a Bible translation, and God wants everybody to have it. So let's see how Brother Tyndale, I'm talking now before the King James translators in a 1611, he's in 1526. Listen to John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was that Word. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by it, and without it was no things made that was made. In it was life. And life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Verse 14, and that word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw the glory of it, as the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, which word was full of grace and verity. Now the reason that's important is, that there were eight men who translated out of Greek into English in the 1500s, and not a one of them translated John 1, 3 by him. Does that speak to you? Every one of these God-fearing men that was willing to die to get this in English 
and translate it as accurately as they could. They said by it, the word of God, it, something spoken. The Logos, not a pre-existent being, but the breath of God's mouth, by it were all things made. Okay? That's 1526. Here's uh, 1557, William Whittingham's Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by it, and without it was was made nothing that was made. In it, God's spoken Word. In it was life, and the life was the light of men. That's number two. All right, number three. In 1560, the Geneva Bible. How many's heard of the Geneva Bible? This is one of the most famous Bibles in the world. It's called the Bible of the Reformation. Of course, Luther did his thing in nailing that on the door in 1517. So this came after Luther, but there were a lot of other reformers that picked up Luther's message and brought us out of the dark ages and Catholicism. So anyway, this is called the Bible of the Protestant Reformation, the Geneva Bible. Let's see what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and that Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by it, and without it was made nothing that was made. In it was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay? Now there's eight in all, and not a one of them. Let me name them for you. The Tyndale Bible, which we read from. The Matthew Bible, 1535. The Tavener Bible, 1539. The Great Cranmer's Bible, 1539. The Whittingham Bible, 1557. Just read out of it. The Geneva Bible, 1560, just read out of it. Uh, The Bishop's Bible, 1568. And then the Coverdale Bible of 1550. Not one of these Bibles say by him. I didn't write these Bibles. Hello? Hello? All right, how many knows that I didn't have anything to do with writing these Bibles, but I just found them, and they support what you and I are saying, that there was no second person of God who was there. It was all created by the breath of God's mouth, Psalm 33 uh, and 6. God spoke. And it happened. You trust me here, but but this one also from 1595. uh, This is called Bishop's Bible. It's one of the eight. And it says, all things were made by it. So if eight top translations say it, and the King James comes along in 1511, I mean uh, 1611, this was 1595. If it comes along in 1611 and says him, and that does not fit 1,000 other scriptures, are you with me? Then I will go with these eight top translations of godly men who were willing to die to get the gospel into English and Tyndale was burned at the stake for this little book. So they weren't out to confuse us or deceive us. Right? 
And the King James, I've already showed you, and I can show you just several more. 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. Most of the other translations there say, He who was manifest in the flesh. They don't say God. If Paul really did write Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh, he went on and said to some others that Christ may be manifest in your mortal flesh. So God manifest in Christ didn't make him God any more than Christ being manifest in our mortal flesh, same word, makes us Christ, right? I mean, come now and let us reason together, right? And y'all are very highly intelligent people and Bible students, and that's, that's number one. Okay, let's go to Revelation, uh, was it 19, 14? All right, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. There's no way I'd argue with that. His name is called the Word of God. Jesus is, the, he is what the Word became. The spoken Word, clearly in verse 14 of all of these Bibles agree with the King James on verse 14 of John chapter 1. And the Word was made flesh. But, but let me show you something here. What a Trinitarian scholar, Dr. Colin Brown, says in his, this guy's a Trinitarian. It might have hurt him terribly to have to say this, but he said it anyway, and I'm glad he did. I have stacks of books by Trinitarian authors and over and over and over they say it is not a Bible doctrine. Charles Ryrie wrote the Ryrie Study Bible. How many know that name? Charles Ryrie. He's on TV and he's not a flaming liberal. He's a conservative fundamentalist. But he, he said, there is not one proof text of the Trinity in the entire Bible. I've got it. He said, so we teach a lot of doctrines without a proof text. He said, if you require a proof text before you preach it, I cannot preach the deity of Christ or the doctrine of the Trinity. You think he wanted to say that? No, but he had to admit it. It's not a Bible doctrine. Okay, so here's what Colin uh, Brown said. Did I say Colin Powell? Colin Brown. <laughs> All right, his book is called Trinity and Incarnation in Search of Contemporary Orthodoxy. Now, he must have gone back and read these eight Bibles here that I just read to you from because he said, it is a common but patent misreading of the opening of John's gospel to read it as if it said, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was God. What has happened here? is the substitution of Son for Word, and thereby the Son is made a member of the Godhead which existed from the beginning. That is a noted Trinitarian scholar who has written a four-volume set that I have in my office. And he says, it is a common, but patent misreading of the opening of John's gospel to read it as if it said in the beginning was the Son and the Son was with God and the Son was God. Now if a Trinitarian admits that, expect Joel Hemphill to say it 
every time I get a chance. He just ought not have said it. Labriska said, somebody needs to notify these guys. Don't say this stuff. Joel is watching. And I ain't nobody. But let me tell you something. God has given me a sword, not a dagger. The Word became flesh. He is the embodiment of God's spoken Word. God told Moses in the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy, he's going to speak my words with my authority. I'm going to give him my name. But if we make the mistake that Dr. Brown is talking about here and insert son for word, we made a mistake that the entire world is making. And it's led them astray as to who the one most high God is, okay?